thank you, Guillaume, for, for acting as my audience and for setting this up. Thank you for the organizer for inviting me. Unfortunately, I'm in Tel Aviv and could make it, of course, to, to Marseille. I hope there'll be some other time to give this talk with, uh, for a live audience. Okay, so here goes. Uh, I will present hierarchical based modeling for large scale inference. Uh, this is joint work uh, with Asaf Weinstein from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Here is my plan. I'll begin with some background. Then I'll introduce our, our new framework for optimal inference, which we call the empirical oracle distribution. And first I'll discuss it from a, I'll present it from a Bayesian perspective. Then I'll also show how it looks from a frequentist perspective. Uh, after that, we'll do the implementation. The implementation by, I'll show how to implement it actually implement, this is our, our framework is a theoretical uh, framework, and I'll show how to implement it in practice using a hierarchical Bayesian model. Um, and, and, and then I'll actually apply it to simulate an example of high dimension logistic regression. Finally, I'll end with a discussion. Okay, some background, some related work. So our work actually looks like model selection, like a model selection procedure that correspond to eliciting a shrinkage part distribution of the model parameters. Uh, there's a lot of literature, widely used methods, ridge regression, all the lassos, spike and slab, and more recently, A, B, slope. Uh, our method would look similar to that, other than that the shrinkage prior will not something that's been uh, specified a priori, but rather we'll see the marginal distribution of the parameters. In this case, uh, our methods look like empirical based methods. For empirical based, looking back, these are things that were introduced first by the work of Robbins back in 56, 1956, James Stein estimation, uh, Larry Brown's, the late Larry Brown's work back in 1966, and more recently, uh, for the Bayesian FDR, where it's uh, classif Bayesian classifications like Bayesian FDRs, by the work of Efron, Sun and Kai, and some work with, again, the late Larry Brown and Ethan Greenstein, 2009. Okay. Uh, where the main difference between what we, uh, or, or what we propose is other than have the empirical, the posterior, uh, the prior distribution we try to estimate, other than it being uh, a theoretical uh, distribu parameter distribution from some theoretical population, it is explicitly uh, the marginal distribution of the parameter vector. Okay. In which sense, our approach is actually best viewed as a multivariate extension of Robbins's compound decision approach, which again was, again, Robbins uh, introduced this, this theoretical framework in 1951. Uh, Kun, Kun Wizang, uh talks about it, discusses his previous work on 2003, and work by Asaf Weinstein, the la again, late Larry Brown and Kun Wizang, uh, I'd like to mention, in 2018, two, two years ago, where the main difference in our work is that this theoretical uh, framework was defined for a very simplistic sequence model in which we have a vector of parameters and for each parameter, uh, it specifies the distribution of a single estimator, where our framework is a multivariate extension that is more general, works for any given likelihood. Uh, what is the compound, uh, what is the, the, the this compound decision approach? What they show, what Robin show, is that for this particular sequence model, the bar marginal base rules with respect to the empirical distribution of the parameter vector minimize the risk for any fixed unknown parameter value. Okay. Finally, lastly, uh, to actually implement um, our approach, uh, we turn to Ferguson works in 1974 and use a finite polyatry on a dyadic partition 
uh, of an interval to define the random distribution. So this is basically the things, I mean, the idea, this is th basically the things that are similar to what we do. Now we'll move on to present our new method, our new approach. Okay, let's begin with some setup and notations. Okay, I'll use theta vec to, will be our parameter vector, will be an M vector, where we initially assume for a Bayesian approach that theta is generated by some known distribution that we denote by pi. So pi is the prior distribution of the parameter vector theta. Our observations, y, uh, are also a vector, very high dimensional, but for a different di dimension, m and n are different. Uh, but still, the, so we have uh, y is a preservation, and we assume that we have, of course, a known likelihood which the, for each uh, for each that for each unknown parameter vector specifies the distribution of the data. Okay, this is all well known. Now some new stuff. Uh, we use this fancy O, this calligraphic O, to denote the order statistic of our parameter vector. Okay, uh, for, for for where. In our case, uh, knowing the order statistic of the parameter vector means that we actually know the empirical distribution of theta. And this will be the, the important point of our method. The idea is that we can get much better inference by knowing characteristics of the parameter vector. In this case, the characteristic we're interested in is just uh, the order statistics. Okay. And then moving on, we denote by perm of m the set of all permutation on M ordered uh, elements. And thus, once we have pi of theta, it specified the distribution of the parameter order statistics. So if pi would be, uh, is the prior distribution, then we use pi tilde, this expression, to denote the prior distribution of these order statistics, okay? And then, uh, once we have, we actually, we denote, if we denote the actual value of the order statistic by theta tilde, so theta, in, in our in this talk, theta vector would be just the set of parameter values, theta tilde would be the set of ordered parameter vector. Uh, so, so, so we can, we can, uh, given theta tilde, we can express any particular uh, realization of the uh, parameter vector as some as some uh, permutation of the ordered uh, parameter values. So, if pi tilde theta, uh, pi theta, pi tilde uh, theta tilde is the prior distribution of the order statistics, then pi tilde uh, sigma of theta tilde given theta tilde is the conditional prior distribution of a particular parameter vector realization given the order statistics, okay? I hope it will be okay. So this is actually the most, uh, uh, the most important notations you have to keep in mind, uh, and I won't pause for questions. Okay, now let's move on to what are our base rules. So our goal is to find this delta, where delta is either an estimator or action or whatever, depending on our loss, that minimize the average risk. Okay, so the average risk is just the usual def definition. We have the loss between uh, theta, the, the, the unknown val the, the parameter vector, and their estimator, and we take the average risk over all values of parameter values uh, drawn from the prior, and then given the parameter values, all the all the all the data uh, realizations. Okay, so this is the regular uh, formulation for the average risk, and then in the standard case we observe y, and then the average risk. Um, the, uh, then the average risk is minimized by the base rule, where the base rule is just a function of the observed data, 
and and this is by definition uh, uh, the expression or, or the delta that minimize uh, the posterior expected loss, where we take the loss and take its average over the conditional parameter distribution given the value of the data. Okay, so this is the regular Bayes rule. What we say is, look, if we don't only observe Y, but furthermore observe the other statistic, then we may define a better Bayes rule. So what is our better Bayes rule? We denoted delta of Bayes, but it's a function not only of the realized data value, but also of the realized order statistic value. So in this case, it looks the same. It's the argument of some mean loss. However, now the mean loss is the conditional distribution of the parameter given the data and given the value of the order statistic. We only assume, also assume that order statistic is equals theta uh, tilde theta. So it's a function both of the data, yvec, and theta tilde. And then per definition, this new Bayes rule yields a smaller average risk than the regular Bayes rule. So this is our the object we're interested in. Okay. Uh, the idea that in general, this is a difficult to derive object because it depends on the prior, which we may or may not know, which may be different. So we only focus on a particular cases in which the prior is symmetric. Okay, what does it mean that the prior is symmetric? For every permutation we take, the prior distribution of the, uh, of the vector of the parameter vector is equal to the prior distribution of the permute, permuted parameter value. With the nice thing that is with this property, if we go back to, to, this, to this definition, we see that having this symmetric prior property gives us that the condition distribution of the parameter realizations given the order statistic is a symmetric finite uh, parameter space with m uh, factorial uh, permutations or re realization. So this this means that this pi, the conditional distribution of each realization given the order statistic has a distribution, equal distributions, one over m factorial. In which case we can, uh, we can it's very easy to derive the conditional, the conditional posterior distribution of the parameter vector given the order statistics and the data, which I remind you is the ingredient we need to find our great new modified Bayes rule. So the first equation is just the definition. What's the definition? On the numerator, we take the joint distribution of the data and our particular parameter realization. On, 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 the, on the new denominator, uh, we have the distribution of y, and the, it's, the, it's the distribution of getting this particular y realization, and just seeing this particular order statistic, which we get it by summing over all different uh, parameter realizations, okay? Uh, here we just, uh, this equation, we get this equation, by by expressing this joint distribution as a product of the likelihood times the distribution of seeing this particular order statistic times the distribution of seeing a realization given the order statistic. We do the same trick for the numerator and denominator. Okay, the good, nice thing to see here that because each time we have the same value of the order statistic, we have this and this in both numerator and denominator. As these cancel out, we get this equation. Okay. And now, let's, because, now the nice thing, because uh, if we assume this symmetric, uh, if we assume this uh, symmetric, uh, a symmetric prior, then we have that all these guys and all these guys are all also, all of them equal, are equal to one over n factorial, then these cancel out. And then we get that for this final equation is only new, only true 
for the symmetric model. And what we see here is that this posterior, uh, this posterior distribution in the symmetric case doesn't depend on the prior we've chosen. So this is our main trick in the paper. The idea that even if we don't know the prior, we can still assess this posterior distribution. Okay. Okay. So what we propose to do is we call this posterior distribution the empirical oracle posterior distribution, and it's something that 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 we may assess that doesn't depend that the only thing it depends on is the actual value of the data and the ordered uh, the, the 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 parameter order statistic. Okay, and how do we use it? We use this distribution, of course, to derive Bayes' rules. For example, let's say uh, the loss we're interested in is a squared error loss. That is, delta, delta y is just an estimator. It looks like an m vector, and each of its components, the first component is an estimator of theta 1, the second one is theta, etc. And this is the, the sum of the of, of the square uh, of, the, of the the differences between theta i hat and theta i. Okay. In this case, we know what the base rule is. The base rule is the posterior mean. So how does the posterior mean look in this case? We sum over all permutations. We take uh, the value. In this case, sigma uh, sigma uh, I the sigma. <laughs> Sigma prime is, is, is the permutation. We sum over all permutation. We take a particular permutation of the order statistic and we multiply it uh, and we weigh each one according to its likelihood, which is something we can assess. Remember that if we know this, then we can also have this, 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 uh, uh, this uh, expression. Okay. Uh, and per definition, uh, the property we have is that these empirical order distribution based rule, rules yield minimal average risk of all based rule for symmetric for symmetric prior. So, the thing you have to keep in mind that most priors that we actually use in practice are symmetric. For example, in all these shrinkage priors, the theta i have and are assumed to be I idea from some joint distribution. Once a joint distribution consists of I ID uh, components, per definition, it's symmetric, okay? So this is the usual case is having this symmetric prime. Furthermore, an MLE can be think can be thought of as the map for using a flat prime. This means that from a Bayesian perspective, using this construct of empirical oracle distribution based rule actually for most cases, once if we would have known, of course, minimize the average risk. Okay, but this is from a frequent, from a Bayesian perspective. The question is, how does this look for, from a frequentist perspective? Okay. So, if we turn to the frequentist perspective, then we have no prior. We just have an unknown realization of theta vector, our fixed unknown parameter vector, and the goal is to find some rules, which is a function of y, that minimizes the risk. Okay, so how would the risk look like? The risk is actually a function of the unknown, uh, of the unknown parameter value, and it's computed for each for each uh, estimation rule, for example, a lasso or what we suggest, etc. And how does it look? It looks very similar to the average risk. We again take uh, it looks we take an expectation over the same loss we've had before. Only this time we fix theta and take the we take the mean over the expected loss over just new data realizations. Uh, the thing is that this is nice. Only by definition, our base rule does something else. That what we do is by construction, if if we want to get the average risk that we've that we've had before, we should take the expectation of this object over 
overall uh, uh, overall prior distribution overall uh, over the prior distribution of a parameter, which in our case is just a symmetric prior that goes over all the permutations <coughs> over parameter space. That is what we have actually by construction minimizes this thing. So we want to minimize this thing, but what we actually do is we minimize the mean risk over all the idea, not for the particular uh, uh, parameter vector we're interested in, but we actually minimize the risk over all permutations of the parameter vector. Okay. The, the idea is that this is, well, I'll show, talk about the discussion, this is actually not so bad, but in particular, if we assume that we have a symmetric likelihood and, and loss, then it, it's quite easy to see that the risk for all the permutations of these parameter vectors are the same. So if we're able to minimize each of them and they're all the same, it means that, that, that in particular, our delta, our epsilon, uh, how do they call it? epsilon oracle distribution uh, base uh, base rule actually minimizes the frequentist risk if in the, uh, out of all deltas out of all rules that are symmet of, uh, out of all symmetrical rules ours is optimal okay so this is the case where we have this symmetric likelihood and and loss and if we go further as to not just assume that our likelihood is symmetric uh, but thinking that our likelihood has this particular sequence model structure and our loss, a compound loss simply means that the loss for entire vector is that the sum of the losses for each of the components, then what we actually get is the Robbins framework as a particular um, example of our general framework. Okay, so uh, I think, if I recall, I finished presenting uh, our theoretical structure. The next question, okay, we have this nice theoretical structure, but it relies on actually knowing uh, this order statistic. How do we know the order statistic, I mean? So now I'll show how we approximate it. We don't order, we don't know it, we rather than approximate it. Okay. Our tool for approximating it is this hierarchical structure uh, that our, our, our working horse in this case, or the convolution machine is what we call the L level hierarchical beta model. Okay, the name is new, but this, this machinery, we use this machinery for, to perform the convolution, but Ferguson back in 1974 uh, suggested using this machinery for density estimation. The idea is that this is something like a more rugged machine to replace uh, Dirichlet process. Okay, so how does it look? What is actually is, it's a generative model for distribution with step function PDFs at endpoints where we have this long vector, where we have, it's, we'll see its levels. That is, if we have like, let's say, in our example, we have in our application, we have eight levels or six levels, and we have two to the power of, of, of six sub-intervals, and we actually need uh, to like have another interval at the beginning. So it's like uh, our, our endpoints are two to the power of L plus one endpoints that correspond to a dyadic partition that has been used uh, by, by Ferguson for non-parametric density estimation. So here are its components. The most important uh, component is a sequence of independent random beta, ver beta random variables, which we denote by on a theta. Okay, so each of these thetas, no, they're not theta, these are phi's, sorry, these, sorry. These, these are not, these are phi's. The phi's have two indexes. The first index L is the level where L goes from one to big L. And then J, we have a few of these, we have, two to the power of L minus one in each level, okay? These are the actual parameters of, the, of this structure. The hyperparameters are these alphas and beta. We'll see that these alpha and beta parameters actually um, they are these conjugate priors that 
in our Gibbs sampler, we update them. But what we'll see is that we begin, we'll, we'll begin with particular values of beta, uh, of, of, of beta hyperparameter would be beta 1, 1, which means that for our, for our initial structure, these fees are just beta 1, 1, which are fees are a, a priori uniform 0, 1 random variables. What we use these random variables is to specify the conditional subinterval probabilities of these dyadic partitions. Once we have these fees, these are the subinterval pro uh, probabilities. Once we want the, 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 the interval probability, we just take products of these. And once we have these pies, it's like a whole host of pies, we just take the pies at the bottom of the tree and we use them to define a step function. Our step function uh, is for the entire support. And the idea that in each in the value of the step function at each interval from a something to a something plus one is this pi L of this something times this, this uh, it's just, it's just, it's the step function. We'll see how it looks like in this very nice schematic, which is actually has this exact same schematic. You can also find it in Ferguson's paper about a lot of, about 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago, okay. So this is a three-level trees. Uh, the first phi, phi one one, uh, gives you the random distribution of either going to the to the left part of the, the left the first partition to the left or to the right. Given the first, uh, we go to the left. We can either go to the left or to the right. The, this probability is phi phi two one. This is one minus phi two one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what these fees govern is how much weight. I give to each subintervals. In this case, the, th the tree has three levels. So we actually take the entire support from here to here and cut it up into eight parts. The probability we, we give to this first subinterval is pi 3 1. The probability we give to the next subinterval, pi 3 2, etc. And how do you compute the pi? The value of the pi here is the sum, is the product of the fees that connect this. To the root. So with these random sub-interval allocations, we actually end up uh, with a random uh, generative, a generative model for random stepwise distribution function. Okay, so this is our main tool. How do we use it? Okay. Oh, I went to the wrong one. Okay. Now this is the right direction. The idea that we use the tool as following. For our actual implementation, we assume the following. We have this parameter vector. We have, we have this parameter vector, which we assign, which we of course don't know. Uh, we have the data and we have the likelihood. And what we try to do is we embed this part, the likelihood, in a made-up hierarchical model for the data. Remember, we have no idea how the data is actually constructed, but in order to run our machine, we assume the data, which is this, is generated as following. First of all, we generate a, a function, a distribution function. This distribution function is simply uh, the step function. Oh, I put my job is simply this step function. Whereas in general, beta can have any, any hyperparameters. When we actually begin our Bayesian machinery, we initially assume that the hyperparameters for generating this function is a beta 1-1. One, one. This, this means that initially these phi's, each of them are uniform 0-1, which gives us like a whole host of different, like non parametric way of having all these, a lot of different functions. The next thing is that once we generate this from this hierarchical beta structure, we assume that the individual parameters of, our, of the, the individual components are parameter vector are generated from this random function. And next, once we have the whole parameter vector, we assume that Y is generated by the likelihood, okay? So parts one and two are made up. 
and we embed the likelihood as the third step for this made up structure. The idea is that because this is such a loose structure, the idea that once we run and compute the posterior probability of this thing, given the data, we actually, uh, the F learns the correct or the, the assumed distribution of the parameter of the parameter vector. in practice what we do is we use a Gibbs sampler to derive the posterior distribution the H beta model given why given the data the, this Y that was generated here is actually equal to the to the uh, to the to the data realizations we see in practice and what our machine gives us is that the Gibbs samples of f of this this um, of this um, random distribution are actually deconvolution estimates of the empirical marginal distribution of theta. Furthermore, Gibbs samplers samples of theta approximate the posterior samples of this. This is what we're actually looking for. The idea that once we run their Gibbs sample with this structure automatically the posterior samples we get from the Gibbs sampler as they approximate the posterior distribution of theta, our parameter vector given the order statistics and y. Where particular, this, this uh, distribution order statistic is actually, uh, the posterior distribution order statistic is actually approximated by this uh, random posterior uh, distribution function. Okay, so we run our machine and the bottom line are our inferences, our base rules uh, for, uh, oh, this is like a mistake, our inferences are base rules uh, that are based on the Gibbs sampling distribution of our parameter vector. Okay, so this is what we do. I understand that this is what's like not a very uh, maybe clear or detailed, uh, detailed explanation. I think it will be good just to see how it's done in practice. Okay, so this is our simulation study. Uh, this was taken by, from a paper by Candes, uh, by, by Candes and Sir, 2019, maybe 2020 now. The idea that we have, we sample a random X matrix with IID entries, ID entries, uh, in this case, we have the X matrix has 4,000 rows, 800 columns. Uh, we have 4,000 observations. Our observations are Bernoulli's. This is like a logistic regression. So each Y is a Bernoulli pi J, where J goes from 1 to 4,000, where uh, PJ are logits of this linear model. Okay. So what we see here is this, this is like, a, it looks like a simple uh, like a simple uh, example from a Bayesian perspective, it's kind of complicated. We have a parameter vector which is 800 that has 800 components, and each of the components affects uh, the distribution of each of the observation. So this is something that's very very different than the simplistic sequence model of Robbins. Okay, and the idea this is a frequency simulation. Each time. Uh, each time we, we consider three types of, 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 of parameter distribution. The first one, beta is, is, is deterministic. So beta con includes 100 uh, minus 10, 100 with a plus 10, and 600 zeros. In the next case, beta are IID normal with mean three variance 16. And in the third case, in third rail, in third um, simulation, beta is with probability half uh, identical to zero, or this uh, I idea normal three, I mean three, and variance at sixty. Okay, uh, so this is how the simulation looks. The interesting thing about the simulation that in this case, both the likelihood it's easy to see that the likelihood is also symmetric. In this case, our theoretical, our, our empirical oracle distribution base rule are actually the minimal, uh, also don't only minimize the average risk, but also minimize the frequent risk 
for each realization of beta, where of course in our simulation we don't know beta, but actually use our Bayesian machinery to estimate its distribution. So here are the first slides. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, sorry. How do we, we actually did I do it? Went the wrong way. Sorry about that. Okay. This is how we implement our H beta approach. For the H beta approach, we assume, which of course is not true, we just assume this in order to apply approach, that the generative model for Y is we generate F from hierarchical beta model with, with six levels. Uh, these fees are initially beta 1, 1, and A is just a regular grid with 60 fine points from minus 20 to 20. This is how, what we think, what we, we assume is the, is the generative va value for, is the generative uh, random distribution for our distribution. Okay. Then for each, for beta going from one to 800, we assume that these beta are IID. Once we have our beta vector, we compute mu. And then given mu, we compute these vector of 4,000 uh, p's and then generate it our y's. This is what we assume. And what we do is simple. We take all this model, we plug in the actual observed values of y and run our Gibbs sampler. And what we'll do is it's like a frequency, it is a frequency simulation where we, 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 we don't, we hide the fact that we know the actual values of beta. And the only thing we plug into our machine is the vector or 4,000 y, y's, which are either zero or one. And what we're doing, we co we'll compare five estimates. The MLE, the corrected MLE of, of, of condensed sir, Lasso and ridge regression penalized likelihood estimates with R from uh, 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 implement for the R GLM net package and our H beta posterior means. And this is how our results look. This is the thing that's in the background. These are not actual results, but the thing that in the background. Recall that, that, that the green stuff is the actual empirical CDF. I mean, I'll sh only show slide, for example, number one, A, example A, in which beta consisted of 100 minus 10. So if we have 100 minus 10, then the green plot is the empirical CDF of the betas. So we have a eight, of the observations, eight is 0.125 mass at minus 10, 0.125 mass at plus 10, and uh, three quarters, 0.75 mass at zero. So the green stuff is the thing we want to estimate. The blue stuff is what our Gibbs sampler gives out. The, if you recall, the Gibbs sampler gives, uh, a, uh, uh, it, it, it gives out, uh, a discrete distribution on a support of 65 regular grid points. So this this is the, the, the so it's we so these blue lines are the actual uh, it's the posterior mean distribution. So we see that we have a mass of about an eighth. It's not really a mass. It looks like a, a jump in the distribution at around minus ten. A jump in the distribution at zero and a jump of distribution and about one uh, plus 10. So we're able, the idea is that without knowing, without knowing the actual distribution, the green one, we can use our hierarchical structure and the likelihood to do the deconvolution. This is the deconvolution of the thing we're looking for, namely the marginal distribution of our parameter vector, which we, which we denoted theoretically by fancy O of parameter vector, the order statistic. Okay. This is how the results look in terms of we recall these are the actual uh, on the in this plot on the x-axis we actually have the real beta values. So we have a hundred minus tens, a hundred plus tens, and eight hundred zeros. So the MLEs are all over the place. And this is like what Candes and and and, 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 and said that in a paper that the MLEs are kind of awful. 
for the zero ones, they have like big variants in general. And for the either plus tens or minus tens, they're over, they're, 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 they're biased. Uh, they're, they're like, they're overly, uh, they're biased either to more the positive side or the negative side. And in general, they're bad. So what they decide, their method is just, let's uh, debias these estimates. Okay. Uh, Lasso, for example, shrinks. So what we see here that these, so, so the black ones were the MLEs, the green are actually the real beta values. And what we see here that the Lasso with cross-validation just shrinks and shrinks very, very, uh, a bit too strong. So we see that all the zeros are around zeros. All the plus tens were shrunk down to about five all the minus 10 were shrunk to about minus 5, whereas our estimates are these blue guys. We see that the zeros are shrunk like similarly well to, to the lasso. Right? Some of these blues, we don't really know if they're 0 or plus 10, while the others, the other, uh, since we actually kind of know where the peaks are at plus and minus 10, we're able to cut, shrink quite well those that are minus 10 to about minus 11, and those that are plus 10 to something like about plus 11. Okay, this is uh, how a shrinkage plot would look. On the x-axis, we have the actual MLEs, okay? Uh, the green dots are actually, for each MLE, the actual value of the parameter. So all these MLEs correspond to cases in which the actual value of beta was minus 10. All these, all these observations are, are the, the, the actual MLEs and beta values for the parameter value, which, which were actually 100, uh, zero, sorry. And these are to, for those that are, are, are one, are plus 10, sorry. What we see here is that the lasso doesn't shrink correctly. What we'd like is that, uh, what we'd like is that to have the plus tens be shrunk to, okay, what we see here that, that the shrinking for the lasso is too strong. The shrinking is too similar to zero, whereas our shrinkage, for those with the big MLEs, we're able to say that they're plus tens. Those with the small MLEs, we shrink them to minus tens. Those in the middle, we don't really know. But those with, with, with the MLEs that are relatively small, we shrink them towards zero. So, so what I actually spot means that our, 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 our estimates, unlike the lasso, which the shrinks arbitrarily without actually knowing how to exactly shrink, our shrinkage is optimal, which is what it's supposed to do. I mean, the idea is that we look, there are, there are, these are what we provide are uh, ideally shrunk uh, base rules. Okay. And the final plot I'd like to show you is that we provide comprehensive, it's not just uh, estimates, we can also have uh, credible intervals, for example. And what we have here is we have uh, the plot looks the same as before. The green, are, are, on the x-axis, we have the MLEs for each of the hate with betas. The, 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 the green values are the actual uh, parameter values. And the idea that because our machine gives us give sample of the theta vector, we can also use our machine to have a marginal credible interval for each of the our, 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 our parameter value. So these are just the credible intervals we have. The nice thing about our credible intervals, because we don't really know uh, the, distri the, 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 the mixing distribution, then we, and we actually have this machine that actually tries to estimate it, if we don't have lots of data, we 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 uh, we accommodate for this lack of knowledge. Uh, the idea that a Gibbs sampler includes in its error also the estimation error of the mixing distribution. That is, uh, it actually has too big a coverage that we'd want to. The idea is that these are supposed to be 95 percent credible intervals, but actually in this case the FCP here is 8 over 800 is like 99% coverage. So the idea I want to make here is that we offer comprehensive, uh, that we don't only do shrinkage estimation, we're also able to have, uh, to provide 
comprehensive inference for any laws you'd be interested, etc. Okay, I think I'm done. No, I'm not done, sorry about that. Uh, this is the summary of the results. The idea that what I've shown here, the results for, for example, A, we could we'd also have results, for example, B and C, and the results here are, are mean square errors for estimating either the beta vector, which we've shown, or we can also just as well estimate the parameter vector, in just cases like X beta, or also the probability. Uh, in all these, I mean, the idea that maybe it's not really fair because we have uh, the idea that we actually have can have posterior means or a base rule for any type of loss you're interested in. Whereas these guys, the idea is you take the estimate and do these plugins, which are uh, can be less. Whereas our other ideal, I mean, maybe it's not really a fair comparison to the other guys, but we'll show them anyways. And, and the values themselves. Are, are, are fractions of MSE with relation to the maximum likelihood estimate. So first of all, these are the adjusted MLEs of uh, condensing So, and we see that, that they're much better uh, than the MLEs themselves. Once we do regularization, but either lasso or ridge, we can still improve the results by a lot. But what we see here that shrinkage is indeed needed, but because we do the optimal shrinkage, uh, we beat everyone. I mean, the idea that because these are the, the by design uh, optimal, then it's not surprising that we get smaller MSCs than these other methods. Okay, so let's wrap things up, discussion. So we've proposed a comprehensive empirical based approach for large scale inference with an explicit estimation target. That is the empirical distribution of the parameter vector. The idea that the scope of our application is cases where we don't have prior information, uh, previous information on the problem, because the idea that having these symmetric priors means actually we can't really tell apart the parameters. If we can think of other problems, which is like a highly, um, I mean, the idea we implicitly assume this exchangeability between, um, between the, the parameters, I mean, the idea, but this, we also have this in like, it's wherever we do, we have lasso or something like that. We explicitly, we implicitly assume the same thing. But in general, I mean, if we do have uh, prior information, uh, substantial prior information, we maybe want to do something else. Okay. The main thing is that given the hierarchical model, the risk and average risks for the different estimators can be readily assessed. We have a machine. The machine characterizes uh, the distribution of the parameter. That is, then we can easily see how good our H beta methods work. We, I mean, we don't know the empirical oracle distribution, but we can we can assess it, evaluate, it, and compare it to how well we would have done using a lasso and uh, et cetera. So if we see that our results are similar, then it's not really worth using our, 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 our analysis. But given that, uh, given examples like, like this particular example, I think by all means, I would, I would definitely recommend uh, using our methods. Uh, furthermore, thanks to this blessing of, of, of dimensionality in these large scale problems, we the basic thing we look at is this loss. A loss for a particular uh, the idea we look at we, we can uh, we have we, the, the idea that our machine gives us this loss that it usually hidden. Uh, but the idea that uh, the loss for a particular realization, which is what I've shown here, is similar to the risk. Because the idea is all these risks are something that in our machine we explicitly have them. So, so once we run our machines, we get a very big, we get a very good notion about how difficult the problem is because we actually are able to, to see the average risks, which I mean, this is like uh, I'm waving my hand, which in these problems, uh, these are our are, 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 are expectations of a very similar large uh, object which have like 
functions which have very high dimensional stuff inside. So even if you change the things inside, uh, quantitatively, the results are maybe very, very similar. So the idea that in general, even if you don't actually use our estimates, the idea of, of, of uh, the idea conceptually, we can think about these empirical oracle distribution average risk as a benchmark for specifying the difficulty of some inferential problem and comparing the est comparing estimation method with our with, with our with our deconvolution machine. The, the idea, namely, that once we have a very big problem, if even if we don't want to or we're not interested in using our particular type of machinery, actually running it gives you very good insight as to the problem itself. And of course, we suggest using our procedure. Okay, as we're in France, I'm done, and this is, I hope is in French, and thank you very much for your attention.